And I understand you were a social worker in this area. Can you explain about this area in Manila, the historical background of this, the, uh, where you film? Yes, um, the place where I filmed actually two of my, my feature length documentaries, it's called Tondo, Manila. Um, it's actually a very historical place. Uh, it's the oldest extant district and it existed even before the nation was there, so it's older than the nation itself. And later on, during the Spanish colonization, um, this uh, area became uh, a harbor uh, when galleon trade was developed, and so this started this uh, wave of um, workers' communities to form around it because it became like an economic district. Um, a lot of the workers became port workers, or traders who would form this very big market called Divisoria. And uh, in this area uh, also uh, was born the uh, probably the greatest Philippine national hero, the founder of the Philippine Revolution that paved the way for Philippine nationhood later um, and weakened the clutches of the Spanish colonialism um, in the Philippines. So you could say it was the birthplace of Philippine nationhood, this place. I encountered it in 2007 while I was still studying in the university. I was studying film, and, but only like very little. It was only after I graduated film school that I got to know more about uh, Tondo. Um, when I was able to see the place more closely, what struck me is this... Um, uh, this very long and rich history, uh, supposedly a very glorious history, uh, but now looking at the place, uh, which is a place of massive impoverishment, to me that was very perplexing, probably even heartbreaking. And so this prompted me to try to know more about the place. And so when I got the chance to do a full-time social work in the area, and at the same time, I didn't have any idea whether I was going to pursue filmmaking or not. So I, yeah, I, I did like two years of social work without any thought of making a film. But a place with such um, rich, um, you know, appearance and systems to it, with, which, with such a, it's like a well of meaning. It's impossible for anyone who has a background in filmmaking, not to think of a film idea. But before that, yeah, I was doing uh, social work and I was uh, organizing among mothers, young people, uh, workers. And during that time, uh, there was a massive government plan that was being implemented in the place. Um, it also incidentally became the site of the largest uh, international port in Manila meaning um, all the imports coming from all over the world, um, from different countries, um, come and pass by this, uh, these communities. And because there's such a big push for like, globalization, for sure, um, there was a plan for the expansion of the port. And the problem was that while they wanted to expand the port, the port at the same time as being an, a place for industry, is also a place where like hundreds of thousands of people are living. It's, it's practically um, housing almost a quarter of the capital city's population. So it was a monumental um, thing that was going to happen. And I thought it was going to happen like in a big um, event, but it proved itself like different that it was actually going to be a very gradual process of change. And so the film became a very long um, observation of how um, yeah, this, uh, this unfolding uh, history uh, is happening from the point of view of, of uh, the everyday lives of the protagonists I followed. Yeah. Uh, with such a complex story, uh, a window into the life of... of uh, the history and as well as ordinary people, what's your, how do you approach the film? How do you find the people and how, what is your approach to do your first film? 
Yeah, um, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, separate my filmmaking and my aesthetics with the process which I took to get to know the place, understand it better, and even form, uh, form uh, a really deep understanding of, of how things work and how the whole Philippine society is reflected in this small community and how even the global economy is reflected in this um, society. So through my uh, long years of immersion in the, in the place, both of a so as a social worker and a, and a filmmaker, um, I somehow already managed to, to like uh, understand the different levels and aspects of this community. And these aspects became the aspects in my, in my film. For example, what was very visible um, was the levels of supremacy that you could see in a very, uh, in, in such a concentrated space. It was obvious that while the residents, the people, comprise majority of the population and probably uh, occupy the largest space, it was obvious also that the power was not in them because every now and then they would be visited by people who actually hold the power. For example, they are visited often by the church to give them um, reflections about how to analyze their lives. Um, and so a lot of people had adopted um, what the church, or how the church views their lives and their fate. For example, in the film, um, in the middle of uh, eviction, there was a mass that was told by um, the cardinal of the Philippine Catholic Church and and his take on the, the, what was happening was to turn the bad news into a good news. So um, while I was aware that this was giving uh, a lot of hope for the people, it was also not a very practical uh, point of view. And they would be visited also by government, but often government comes to ask for their votes or to, what do you call this, to bring bad news which this time the bad news was that they were going to be evicted. But the highest level of supremacy that was very visible was that which wasn't speaking. And that was the port industry, which is not native to the Philippines, but um, a port industry that's connected to a global economy and how the global economic system is arranged today um, in, the, in the Philippines, in Asia, and in the world. So these um, things became manifest to me during the long time that I was immersing there. And I wanted to convey those things that manifested to me. And I arranged it into a film concept. Um, and one, one event that prompted me to really form the idea for my, my, my two films, actually, is a moment when I was talking to a midwife in the second floor of a shack. And the midwife um, was telling me how people were giving birth in the houses because they didn't have access to hospitals and stuff. And while we were talking, across the street, there was a funeral that was ongoing. And the midwife said the funeral was going on for like two weeks already because the, 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 per the family of the person who died didn't have money for that. And while we were talking about this, I felt that I we were talking about birth. There's a death across the street. And in between, container vans with labels, Evergreen, Hanjin, Yangming, Italia, Mayors, uh, container vans from different countries. It was as if the world was passing by, cutting across our conversation. And I thought the best way probably to represent this place is to represent it through a lifetime, to different stages of life and juxtapose this life lifetimes from birth, youth, adulthood, and death side by side with this large industry that represents a global economy. And that's, I think, the drama in it. If, if we are looking for a drama, there's no larger drama than that. And so I tried to convert that into a filmic um, idea, a filmic concept, and uh, naturally, organically, turned out to be an observational way of filmmaking. 
I didn't, I thought that the visibility of things were rich enough such that they already uh, can be found in the smallest spaces, in the corner of the house. You can see um, like, like history is imprinted there. The global system is imprinted there. You just see a television of your protagonist and what comes out of the television is not about this place. It's about something else in the world. So I thought that observational cinema was the best way to, to do that. So when I finally found the resources, I organized a team and um, I would go to filming uh, only with the sound uh, recordist, but I was supported by a group of um, researchers, like a production assistant and researchers, and they would search this, uh, the different communities of Tondo um, for what I was looking for. So I was looking for a pregnant woman who was about to give birth in a couple of months. And so we interviewed and pre-interviewed um, tens of women who were about to give birth. I probably filmed like five births. By the time that I, I finished filming the birth um, sequence, I was already too familiar with how birthing takes place and already doubting whether I want to give birth or not <laughs> because of everything that I witnessed. So, and also we, we looked for a lot of 10-year-olds and we looked for uh, workers who are working at the port um, and then uh, we looked for a funeral that was ongoing where you could see the visibility of the container va vans passing, the port was visible, etc. And finally, from all the people that we pre-interviewed, um, we found four. Of course, it's not like a neat process, like finally we found four, no. It's like in different periods, yeah, we found uh, the four protagonists. And my sound recordist and I would normally come at dawn and leave until uh, they're about to sleep. Sometimes we even sleep over. Yeah. And I think uh, it's not that I have to film everything that happens from dawn until nighttime. No, that's a very impractical way of, of making observational cinema. It's just that a lot of really interesting things happen when people just woke up and when the light of the sunrise is there or when the sun is just setting and people are trying to cram finishing their days. It's just that these are really interesting times. And also at the same time, I like to stay in the place where I'm filming, in the house where I'm filming for a long time, even if I'm not uh, shooting. Um, that allows me to develop my, my approach to the film while I'm there and to see things that are really unexpected. Yeah, but, but of course, I mean, as, as I was talking to you earlier, um, it's not like with observational cinema that you just watch what's happening in front of you and film everything that happens or film, oh, this is interesting, I film it, oh, this is interesting. No, it's not like that. It's like when I find a character, when I find a protagonist, it's normally because of elements in the person's life that I want to highlight and which connects well with the other protagonists. For example, um, the protagonist in, like, in the adulthood segment of the film, um, there were so many possible workers that we can film. They were all um, working at the port, walking back home, etc. But this particular protagonist was working in the midnight shift, the night shift, and through his door, I could see straight the massive cranes of the port. While he's cooking, I can frame the same um, everyday life, cooking rice, and on the side of the frame, you could see the crane, how, what you can accomplish by montage, you can com accomplish in a single shot. So it was um, a very nice space that, he, that the protagonist offered me. Um, at the same time, at the center of the house of this protagonist was a television. And beside the television was a Santo Nino statue, a Christ the Child statue. And so in the very center of the house, represented are the two major movers of Philippine culture, the mass media and the Catholic Church. You know, so it's like an understanding of how society works somehow, makes, can make one sharper 
of what to look at, what to look for, and how to look at them. And when they are finally found in spaces, and they will definitely be found, because these are not imagination, like, it really exists, no? Social systems do exist, and they exist in a particular way. And the fact that they are a system means that they are visible and they appear probably almost everywhere. And true enough, these systems appear in the smallest house that you can find in, in Tondo. So I frame my filming in the appreciation of these elements. If these elements do not exist in a pronounced way, I do not choose that uh, space or protagonist. I only choose uh, protagonists and spaces that really manifest um, an, an amalgam, a condensation of these elements and are very rich in itself that you don't even need uh, dramatic things to happen to find meaning in the times that you are filming. And so these elements that I pre-plan before I shoot, I, I normally conduct a pre-interview and a really extensive pre-interview. I'm quite OC, so I want to know everything before I start filming. And so I know when I pick a portion of this person's life that I know that I, I picked it right and I'm not missing anything. I know I'm just gonna, if this is a lifetime, I know I'm just gonna you know, portray a very little bit, but I want to wisely figure out which bit I really want to get into. And so I do a, an extensive pre-interview and from that pre-interview, I either write my framing of this character, of this protagonist, or I draw something, I paint something that, okay, this is the atmosphere I want to convey. These are the meanings that um, the space and the person exudes. And so every time I go filming there, uh, I just wait for these elements to manifest, these atmospheres to manifest. And because, as I said, the process is like you are ingesting what I call the whatness of the place. Everything has a whatness. Every person has a whatness. Right? Like, for example, a, a glass of water or a glass, uh, a cup, for example, has a whatness. It's not just a cup. If you really look inside a cup and what a cup is about and how it has, made, has been made, there's a lot of things contained in the cup. And so the process is like trying to look deeply into things ingesting this whatness of things and converting that back uh, in cinematography and in sound. And because they are, you know, coming from that thing itself, then, nor then it's expected that it will come out, it will manifest. So, yeah. Babasa daw si eh. Ha? Nagbabasa. Butas naman yung plastic eh. No? Nagbutas yung plastic na nibigay sa akin. Ito ako na dito na muna. Ayaw binigilo. Ayaw. Arsi lang. Muta! Muta ah, muta. 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 Ito. Tapos na, sakto pamalo dyan? Ayaw tumatulog kung isa eh. Ah. Harap doon, harap. Tulog na tulog. Huwag maingay eh. Mama, akin ang chinilas ko. Kuha mo ka pa. Lukor na ako ni Boron. Tulog na, pikit mata. Oh, 
tolong jaga pikir saja pikir Jupi ba tawagin mo? Walang yan, di ko nakita. Kalayas mo ang animal ka. Diyan ako, nag-iugutan. Sino yung auto sa'yo? Pati ka nagsasabi, hanap ako ng hanap sa'yo. Ang bisis ko ba sabihan, pag inutusan ka, sabihin mo. Hindi ka nang higa ako sakit. Ay, nako. Para hindi ako maghanap sa'yo. Yeah. And so, when you finish your first film, what gives you an idea want to do the second film? Because it's up the same area. Yeah, um, the first film was actually like a research of for the second film. The, the 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 process for both films was the same, or like juxtaposed into each other. Um, when I did my first film, I was just um, yeah, I mean, out of film school, and then during doing my social work, so I had no idea what how to produce films, you know how to make money, to be able to shoot, to pay a team, etc., to survive long years of shooting. So I was only able to do research and make a very simple portrait of um, a, a family, of a woman who is about to give birth uh, for several months from the moment I started filming. And her shack, was a, her house was in the edge of the Manila Bay, so it has had very good visibility with the, with everything, with the environment, the port, the movement of the sea, etc. And so it was, it became like, uh, like a, a, a story unfolded, and it became a film when it was supposed to be just part of the research. And because of that film, I started to get exposed to the international festivals, and I started to understand how to produce uh, documentaries. And I, I tried to learn it, uh, trying trial and error, until I was able to raise enough money to pull together a film which is of a larger scope, which is the second film, the In the Clause of the Century Wanting. It's definitely not a film that I can do all by myself, which I did somehow with the first film. We were only two, and the other one was just a friend of mine who was kind enough to, to stay with me for an entire year um, to, 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 to do research and to, to film them. Uh, but yeah, definitely this, the, the idea was actually much larger than I was capable of in the beginning. So I had to learn how to pull together the resources also. And so after, as I was saying to someone earlier that in the course of making this film, I learned a lot about cinematography, but also I learned a lot about producing. Yeah, so... Uh, it's it's not like a ready-made uh, thing that I was already capable of uh, doing. So yeah.
well, you you spend months and years with your protagonist. How do you gain their trust? I mean, they know you, right? So, you know, and do they mind you filming them all day long? Um, the process of getting to know, because while I was familiar with the community, it was not, I was not necessarily, I mean, they were not necessarily familiar with me. Um, so the process is that whenever I approach um, um, people uh, to ask them if they wanted to be in the film, um, I try f one of the key processes that I that I do in the research stage is to make a long conversation with them, not necessarily about the film or their life, but about their take on issues, their philosophies in life, etc. And I, in the in the process of that, I try to explain also, also myself, my way of looking at their situation, my way of looking at the world, um, my take on the issues that are bothering them. And very often in this conversation, uh, you already discover whether you, your view of things are somehow similar, or yeah, you agree with each other on on on. Uh, important matters that affect them, and that is the foundation of the relationship. If there is um, that um, similarity in worldview or in views, then it becomes this. It becomes the strongest foundation for collaboration. I refuse to subscribe to the practice of documentary filmmaking, which economizes or what you call this monetizes mm -hmm. the relationship between the filmmaker and the film subject. Mm -hmm. While I understand that there can be circumstances where that is appropriate, in general, I think I tend to gravitate towards the practice, which is like more collaborative. Mm -hmm. And and so I think this relationship uh, translates into how the filming um, um, happens. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, I tell them, okay, um, I will be coming here for months and months, probably sometimes almost every mm -hmm. day, but don't bother, uh, I'll just be here. And usually I'm a very silent um, shooter. And I mean, in general, I don't like to, 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 spe to speak a lot in a like, small talk, everyday conversation, etc. So they get the, the hang of it already that I come there with a person, we are with a camera, and somehow they get trained at what I was looking at as well. And when they see and understand what I always, or I, what I usually shoot, then there's some, what happens is some like wonderful invisible collaboration. Like sometimes I would notice that protagonists would actually allow for things or if, for scenes to happen um, without me telling them for things to happen. And the thing is coming from this uh, foundation of like, uh, um, discussions that, mm -hmm. that we we do like very often, especially in the beginning, and um, coming from them, yeah, slowly understanding what the film will be about. Mm -hmm. A lot of the scenes in the film, actually, even the funny scenes, um, are collaborative scenes. But it is not like something that we spoke of. But you just know. I mean, as a filmmaker, you know. Okay, he's setting up something. But it's not like he's acting or something. It's like the way of people mm -hmm. to to direct the film with you, and they have every right to to do that. And sometimes it really becomes a very uh, very amazing scenes. It's it's not uh, difficult to stop filming. It's when I think because as I said, I start with a decision on the elements that I want to put together in the film. It starts with a frame of mind already, a concept. And this concept is broken down into the elements. And when I've already consummated the filming of each particular element, then I know that I'm finished filming. Uh, for this particular film, um, uh, I had to what I what what I had to wait for f for a long time was actually the actual process of eviction, because while it was a big project to evict like hundreds of thousands of people, it happened in a very slow pace. So there were years where it wasn't happening, and when finally it was going to happen, then I, thankfully I had the resources to, to go and form the team immediately and, st and sh start shooting again. So when the evictions happened in 2015, um, that's when um, 
uh, that's the, fo the process that I followed when the evictions finished. And by that time, I also already f uh, finished filming the other elements mm -hmm. of the concept. Then that's when I knew that I finished. But also, like, something peculiar happened um, in the film. And probably we can watch the clip. I thought, actually, the, the demolitions that happened in the scene, that was the last day of my shooting. And I thought that it, it's going to be the ending, that a lot, of, a lot in the community already had their houses demolished. And in another scene, you could see them um, loading their, their things, their entire possessions in the trucks. And I thought, well, that's uh, how it ended. But um, something happened on this last day of shooting. I already called the rap uh, with the team, and we, or, we were already back in the, in the car, in the service that we were using, and having our lunch before we finally like leave the place. And I suddenly felt that after seeing the demolitions, and after seeing the entire, um, uh, a part of the entire uh, community already in rubbles and with broken wood and houses, etc., I th I thought that I felt that something was different, like uh, that something wasn't uh, captured yet, and so I didn't know what it was. But thank God I had that intuition, because when I went back um, into the community, when the demolition team left already, um, it was uh, amazing how what was the rubbles after the demolition, then started to come up back together again. The people just retreated for a while, and then when the government is, uh, is away, and when the camera is gone, then they started to cautiously build back their house. And so I thought, this is the ending. <laughs> uh, that the story continues, that what's supposed to be 
the supreme force of government and, and industry is not necessarily uncontested. That uh, what's the story that I've captured is not yet decided. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the, the end, that ending, um, while I could have decided uh, based on a plan, that ending came by, by chance. And I think uh, a lot of uh, that was make, that's what makes it documentary. Mm -hmm. A lot of elements are are actually just things that that happen when you are in the right place at the right time, and when you follow intuitions, whether or not um, they have clear basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like because that intuition for me to go back was like very abstract. It just something feels off, you know. Mm -hmm. I have to go back. So when I came back, lo and behold, mm -hmm. the final scene of the film was just about to be um, to be recorded before my camera. So are they still there, the, the community? Yes, the community has uh, stayed there, uh, but they have endured a lot of attempts of demolition already. Um, the government offered them relocation outside of uh, Metro Manila, and a lot of the relocation sites that the government uh, offers are areas which are very far flung, um, very far certainly from their jobs and livelihood. So after a month of trying to make it work, um, a lot of the people who were evicted had no chance, uh, had no other choice but to come back. And that became like a spontaneous wave of people who were evicted and demolished coming back and what's supposed to be was, as, as I said, a supreme force trying to decide on the fate of this community became contested by that wave, which I could only um, um, surmise as a wave of um, trying to survive. It was just a survival instinct that when you already like um, uh, have nothing to eat where you were, uh, where you were thrown, you will necessarily have to trace back your way to where you can survive. Mm -hmm. And the problem with the uh, government uh, projects on housing, um, the reason why they don't work is that they don't take into consideration this very basic logic that when you give people a house, they're supposed to be able to survive there. You know, you're not only relocating people from house to house, but you're relocating a community, a way of life, a way of survival. Um, so the conditions of the people, some of them have relocated, um, but a lot of them have gone back. One of my protagonists, um, um, I gave her some help after the film because she was actually um, a migrant from the Philippine South and knowing that there's not much uh, future for her in, the, in, in Tondo. After giving birth, um, I asked her, do you want to like, take the ship back to the Philippine South, to mm -hmm. Butuan? And she said, I would really love to do that because she was actually a victim of human trafficking and it was not her choice to be in, uh, in the city. And she just did not ever gather enough money to have a fare to, mm -hmm. to go back. And so, so I said, I'm gonna look for sponsors to, to find a ticket for you to go, to go back to the province. And I asked her even if she wanted to bring her husband mm -hmm. because her husband was beating her up. So I said, like, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna bring him? Are we gonna get a, another ticket for him? And she was uh, thinking about it. <laughs> and after, yes, okay. So we bought ticket for the whole family and, and they're back in Butuan. But of course, I mean, uh, they're now living in a different version of the community in, in Manila. So different fate, the com fates, the community is still there. Um, there are areas of the community that are trying to resist these projects and ask for more humane um, housing programs. Mm -hmm. I think this resistance movement is advancing, but also um, especially recently that it was revealed that a lot of the housing projects, the government actually built hundreds of thousands of houses supposedly for communities like this, but it was just exposed like probably a year or two ago that 
hundreds of thousands of these houses remain unoccupied and are actually starting to get reforested because they're usually in mountainous areas or remote areas near the forest and whatever. And these, these housing uh, projects have started to get reforested because they failed. Mm -hmm. Nobody would live there. The people that they intended to benefit from these um, did not find benefit in it. So now it's a big um, issue in the Philippines, the housing condition and uh, how the government is, is dealing with it. Hi, I just want to ask a little about the editing process. Um, so in, in the Q&A just now, you talked about that in your head, you had elements of, you know, of what you foresee. So did you uh, parallelly edit at the same time or did you like, you went back afterwards and had all your footage and you just went through it and the editing process was really fast. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the editing process was far from fast. Um, after like probably eight years of filming, six years of filming, um, I gathered like more, uh, around more or less 200 hours of material. And when you're confronted, when you're shooting, before you shoot, you're confronted with a reality and you edit the reality in your head form a film concept. But when you're editing, you're confronted with the reality of your footage, which is something else distinct from the reality of what you shot. No, so you have to go deep now into that reality. If you immersed in the reality of the situation before filming, this time I had to immerse into the reality of my footage. I had to watch in real time without trimming even the excess, even the badly shot stuff. I had to watch everything in real time. And it took me months to finish just this watching. Uh, to the point that I was already very angry, you know, you don't know what you're angry at. It's just like punching the table because you're just already too impatient. But it is a ne necessary process because the process of watching your footage is a process of impregnating yourself again to have the creative energy once again to form your material now into, into a film. And whatever I thought during filming and during research, whatever concept, I did not necessarily forget that, but I had to put it at the back of my head. You know? And then when after I finished shooting, that's when I can create a new concept. And thankfully, it wasn't very far <laughs> from what I had in my head. Of course, it was different. But the elements, I, 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 I'm thankful that I was actually able to film them and it manifests in the footage. And from that, um, I made this like an uh, outline and uh, made uh, how the concepts and elements come together, which scenes manifest them, and made uh, short, uh, shorter than 200. Eventually I had 30 hours of good material, a good meaning, they manifest, the, um, they were filmed well and they manifest the concept that I had in mind. And from the 30 hours, in the end, I had a four feature length documentaries, <laughs> which I could probably release separately, you know? I mean, something you can, because it has an, a, it had a beginning, a middle, and an ending. It had a concept, it was filmed uh, well and properly, it had a development. It was a practically four feature length films. But of course, I mean, uh, we don't do this to retail the material, so you have to stick to the vision. However attractive the thought of releasing four feature length, and that's when I uh, was able to, that's when I started to work with an editor who co-edited the film with me and uh, we juxtaposed um, um, all the four feature lengths into a single film. So I had to shed a lot of very, very nice scenes that worked for each individual timeline but didn't work for the combined um, timeline. So it was a very painstaking process. And in, in my process working with the editor, our, um, our creative uh, relationship is very conceptual. Like we have this terminology that when you just observe us in the editing room, only two of us can understand. Like, um, for example, I, I told him we have to, we have this snake in the film, but before the snake appears, 
we have to bring out the worms little by little. And then the worms start to get big and stuff like that. So it's like the industry um, that was going to encroach on the daily lives of people that was the snake. And everything else about the system that is connected to that industry um, are part of the snake. But before I revealed the snake, I put different absurd elements in the beginning to hint that a snake is coming. So we call these hints worms. So like practically the beginning of the film is just a, a little worms coming out and that you hopefully the, the intention was the, the audience will feel that something is being hinted at that we will only discover uh, later. So that was the, the process. So there are practically two concepts. The concept and the filming stage and then which you practically forget or intentionally forget so you can now confront a different reality, which is the reality of the filmed material, and uh, which is video and sound that you actually captured. And that's where a new concept is uh, created. Sorry, can I have a follow-up question? How do, you, how do you explain that to your uh, uh, commissioners or people who may finance this film? Because you, you had one idea initially, and then, and then later it, it develops into something else. Um, thankfully, I was also producing the film myself. And uh, the funds that, um, that supported me uh, supported not just a story, you know. The funds actually, especially the international funds, they support, yes, the story, but they also support the filmmaker and the general vision. And the, the funds know that um, when they support documentary, that things are bound to change. If you submit a documentary project in development or in, in the early production, they would know that a lot of things are going to change and they don't really expect you to follow like everything that you wrote for as long as you stick with the general vision and the heart of the, you know, there are also people and when they judge, uh, uh, when they judge, uh, Ruby would know this for sure, when they judge uh, proposals, um, they would read with an understanding of who this person is and what she is trying to probe or look at. They do not find, ah, this is a great uh, turn of events in the story. No, it's not like that. So, yeah. But I'm lucky enough that I don't have a, like a, a television commissioner who would be more um, picky about how, how things turned out. Yeah. Um, for the past few years, we know that in Tondo, Mainstream media has showed that there have been a lot of crime, uh, crime scenes, and that there are a lot of, you know, of course, uh, causes of death and so forth because of this crime, especially in Tondo. How do you maintain your safety throughout the whole process, especially after many years of filming here? Um, to be honest, not one instance during the eight years that I was coming back and forth, and even at some point practically living in Tondo, um, never once was I robbed of anything. Never once had I been tre threatened or, uh, what do you call it, catcalled or something. Uh, I think um, the problem is that the mainstream media depict uh, stories uh, that are, you know, that fit their frame mostly. They need a beat that, for example, they have a crime beat. So they go around looking for crime. And so when you look at, when you have a concentration of a quarter of Manila's population, there, there will necessarily be crime, not because people there are, are violent, but because the ratio of things will, will necessarily like, um, have uh, crime. I think uh, the people living in Tondo care more about their jobs and working hard and putting food on the table rather than harming somebody else. And because it's also a population of um, largely migrant, migrants from the Philippine countryside, a lot of them also actually have a very mild mannered, um, you know, culture and very respectful as well. But these things are not, uh, you know, nobody would uh, make news that people in Tondo are very respectful, no. Uh, they would make news about something that 
you know, that, that, that would uh, sell. That's the nature of uh, news. And that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to make um, this film as well, is to, um, to understand how people who are othered by the mainstream in urban areas are actually um, not uh, very different from, from anyone else. I mean, we are very similar. You probably are very similar from, from them. There are as brilliant people there as there are in this room. The kids that I've seen and encountered in that place are probably even more intelligent than, than many of us. And imagine how much intellect it takes to survive a life like that. I think that's, that's quite a, uh, a lot of um, mental and emotional intelligence required to be able to survive these conditions and come out um, still with intact dignity. So I would like to, yeah, I mean, uh, oppose somehow that view that, that it's, it's a very crime-laden community where, of course, it happens, but crime also happens in uh, rich subdivisions. In, in areas where the rich happens. Crime happens very largely in the, even in government, probably in a bigger scale in government. So yeah, I wouldn't uh, put any, any consideration uh, to, to any little criminal activity that happens there in relation and in proportion to the larger crime that is happening in many societies. Thank you for your amazing sharing. So um, after hearing, hearing your story of being a social worker and then being a theme maker, I kind of try to find a connection between the two jobs. And I feel like uh, the two jobs are similar to each other by the fact that it kind of speaks for the little people about their voice that are normally unable to be heard for the public. So I want to know, is this one of the value or one of the reason behind you are trying to theme all these documentaries, and also I would like uh, to know more between like why do you choose to be a social worker after you graduate and then subsequently switch to a filmmaker? Thank you. Um, I think uh, rather than social work being the uh, having preempted, uh, having like prompted me to make uh, these films, I think doing social work before and uh, making continue to making. Continu continuing to make films now is, a, is, is, is prompted by, by, by something else, which is, um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think this is very normal that uh, people want to understand um, their society and people want to understand what they don't understand yet. And I'm not sure with other countries, but with the Philippines, there's a lot to understand. History is not well written. History is written from very few perspectives. A lot is hidden in history. And so a lot of the things we see in Philippine society have no real uh, sufficient explanation. Um, for example, um, and, and co coming from uh, countryside, um, I, I co came from the countryside and only came to the city in a during college to study. So everything was very fresh to me. And the problems that I was seeing in the urban space, uh, I couldn't find any answer to, to, to any of them. Uh, uh, seeing like massive impoverishment, and I use the term impoverishment instead of poverty, because I think poverty is a condition, impoverishment is a system that creates poverty. Uh, seeing massive impoverishment to me was something that had to be understood. Uh, I couldn't, uh, especially as I explained earlier, that it was existing in a place that was very historical. It was supposed to be a glorious place. This is the oldest kingdom, that, uh, a very old kingdom that existed even before the nation. So there are these um, questions that just cannot be left unanswered. And documentary and social work gave me the chance to confront these questions. And I think these uh, questions like this and questioning in general is something that is inherent in all of us. And, I, and probably even um, starts in us as kids until we are educated not to question. So the, the problem is, um, and, and uh, 
probably I was not uh, educated enough to stop uh, questioning. So I was too naive and uh, I had to follow these, uh, these questions. And social work and filmmaking became really, really, um, I wouldn't say convenient, but became really um, apt, appropriate instruments for me to continue asking and answering and discovering new questions, etc. And it's a very fulfilling uh, opportunity to have. No offense to, to, to those who chose uh, uh, other paths, no? but I, I myself couldn't uh, live without confronting uh, those questions. Maybe I'm just uh, too in tune with the, uh, you know, with the human nature to, yeah, to ask, to understand. And I'm hoping that, uh, that, uh, that a lot of filmmakers, and I think a lot of documentary filmmakers who use this instrument of, of uh, documentary filmmaking also are coming from the same position of um, asking and probing. That is really a power of camera. It allows you to dissect what is supposedly a very chaotic and uh, massive scenery or landscape before you. Just the fact of a camera giving us the capacity to frame is practically giving us the opportunity to put society, life, and, uh, and everything else into slides that you can look back on and think um, um, more deeply than when you will, when you're just witnessing it, just like this, or face to face. Um. Uh, thank you for your sharing and for the film that you made. I have a question about your role as a filmmaker because you came in with a intentional vision and it's quite difficult to be in a position where you're intentionally there to observe, but you also have to ma maintain your covertness in that situation. So what are some uh, decisions that you had to make so that the story is focused on your subjects um, your subjects' lives rather than the frame you had or the frame that the government puts it? Um, as, as I said, the process itself, um, for me, uh, helped that there is not much disjunct between what actually happens or what is visible and what I imagine. Because like the long period of immersion, I am able to understand how things go, what's visible, how uh, um, elements combine with each other, like what are the, how aspects of society are visible in, in the place, in Tondo. And so the idea that I had for the film did not come from the clouds. They come from uh, an intense observation. And because they came from intense observation, there is trust and confidence that the idea will manifest because it is where it came from. And I'm, I'm trying to just uh, capture it again in images. What I saw, I'm trying to capture again in images. So there wasn't much effort in you know, um, trying to build a story or whatever. Uh, I, I'm not even after story. I think story is a choice. Uh, whether you want, um, um, I mean, the traditional story of having like a, a different events happen to your character, it's a choice. Um, story is also a social condition. Um, the difference of the personal time of the protagonist as opposed to the historical time that's happening in the background of the protagonist, the juxtaposition of these two elements are also, is also a story. It's also, there is inherent drama even in, uh, in these um, things that are not conventionally thought as, uh, as stories. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Would you mind explaining a bit on uh, what you think uh, exactly is your philosophy, or is it a philosophy towards life in general, or is it a philosophy towards making uh, movies and documentaries? And if uh, you meet people who don't share the same philosophy with you, uh, how would you deal with it? Uh, do you discard the ideas, or do you try to talk to them and understand more, and how do you, you, know, how do you handle that afterwards? Um, it, when, when I said like the same philosophy, it's more like um, um, if we share the same view about um, society and about what should um, 
how should the, the course of uh, Philippine society go through in relation to the problems that, that they are facing. And um, yeah, like for example, um, if a protagonist is very much influenced by the view that uh, we should just um, um, we should just uh, abide by everything that the government um, tells us to do, what to, to do. I know somehow that probably it's not going to work because I need uh, people who are somehow, you know, uh, who have a critical mind for them to understand what I'm happening, what's, what, what I'm going to do. Because if they don't share the same critical view about their situation, then I probably I'm going to betray them by making a film that's opposite to what they believe in. So I want to be faithful to that um, uh, critical view. So I, 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 I look for, for characters who are like them. If I find people or encounter people that um, have a um, more submissive view about the situation, I would t make it a point that I try to explain a different perspective. I cannot take away the social worker in me um, even during the research, there was even a time when the evictions were happening and um, uh, the government was already pushing them, if you don't sign up, submit your requirements, your documents, uh, you're going to end up with nothing. You're going to end up in the streets with no house and we're not going to give you any more housing. And so people were like panicking, what are we going to do now, etc. And I was like, I want to hold a meeting. <laughs> It, it, I had I really had the the you know the impulse to hold a community meeting and to like just put the logic on the panic because I knew how this is going to unfold I've witnessed this before etc but of course I had to hold back myself because there were other organizations who were doing that but what I did was that whenever my camera was down and the neighborhood was talking about um what was happening I would definitely not hold back in sharing my views and I point them to the direction of those who are organizing the community and say, um, you should attend that meeting because you're going to know better. Uh, I think you are right that the government is lying to you or the official is <laughs> lying to you or something. I mean, I don't hold back. I don't believe in you know, trying to be neutral, especially when you already know what is right and what is wrong. You know, we cannot blind ourselves when we already understand. So you can only act on that understanding. Hi, um, I'm interested in the uh, your protagonist. Like after you um, finish, you know, filming everything, and the film comes out, um, have they seen it? And what are their reactions on to your film? Um, only two of the protagonists ha uh, have seen it. Uh, the the one of the protagonists, the pregnant woman, because he, she's now in a. Um, in the south of the Philippines where where he, she came back home. I hadn't had a chance, and I was editing for two, three, two years, hadn't a chance to show her the film yet. But the two other protagonists saw the films in different stages, uh, in rough cut, and the other one in the near, near of a final cut. And it's, it's, a, it's fun because they treat the film like a photo album like a memory of their life. And it's, it's just natural that when you're watching a film about yourself, uh, you're also waiting for your image to come. So it become, became a very fun experience of them um, watching themselves and memories of things that went by. Because they are now much, much older than when I shot with them. Like the kids that I shot with are now like 18 years old. The kid... Um, uh, what, the one that I didn't show in the clips is now, um, yeah, an adult, and the adults are actually aging already, and so it's like, um, yeah, it became like a memory project for them. Um, one thing I did was um, I, I allowed for a screening in a relocation area, um, not directly to the people who came from Tondo, but in from, from a different community, and. I wasn't able to attend that screening, but uh, the the organizer said it was a nice uh, uh, discussion after, and people were really like trying to um, reflect on how they lived in the city before and what happened to them. They could really discuss um, 
basically the film becomes a catapult for for discussion. And I really plan to, when I get uh, hopefully funding support for distribution, to make a grassroots distribution of the film in uh, in communities where where I showed it in, in similar communities in the Philippines. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you.